Well, we have a, a very distinguished faculty here with us today, and so let's get started with our program. Our first speaker will be Dr. Venugopal, who is, uh, as I said, a distinguished faculty member in Chicago at Russia University, and he'll be uh, leading off with a discussion about uh, recent uh, updates and progress and management of uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Dr. Venugopal. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. And I also want to thank the organizers, particularly Dr. Shah, for inviting me to meet with all of you and uh, discuss this topic. I think I have two topics uh, today. One is CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. As you know, is the commonest uh, leukemia in the Western world. So over the next 30 minutes or so, what I'll do is uh, first <coughs> give some introduction about the topic in terms of what is new <coughs> in prognosis assessment and what we know about the disease. And then we will, or rather I will focus on some of the new information that came in the last uh, two meetings, American Society of Hematology last year, December, as well as this year's American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting. Not because I'm interested in this area, but uh, chronic lymphatic leukemia is one of the diseases where we have seen dramatic changes, not only in the understanding of the disease, the biology and how medications work, but also there's one disease where in the last one or two years, if you look at new drugs have come to the market. And these are not, as I will show you, just new drug. They are medications which work based on pathways that we know in cancer. You know, gone are the days where we just give chemotherapy that uh, destroys all the cancer cells. And then if we are lucky, we will destroy most of the active cancer cells. Whereas now, we, as you can see in oncology particularly, believe in focused or targeted therapy. And the drugs that I'm going to talk about, which got approved in uh, CLL are classic examples of how we can identify pathways by which cancer cells flourish and block it without interfering with the normal cells. So with that introduction, <coughs> I do not have any conflict of interest. Can I give it here? Okay, so these are the topics I will focus on. One, just a few slides on diagnosis and prognosis. Then I will talk about the treatment, focus on treatment. FCR, as you know, is one of the standard chemotherapy regimen in CLL. And more recently, we have BR or bendamustine and rituxan. Uh, and I'll tell what is most recent about these two combinations. And the new agents I will focus on are ibrutinib, idelalisib, which are already in the market, and the third one, which is likely to come end of the year, which is ABT199. And also, I'll talk about a novel strategy where we are now able to <coughs> eliminate evidence of leukemia without using a drug, using patients' own cells. So some of the information I'll be talking will be from this program, the slides I made for uh, this program. As you know, whenever there is a national meeting, uh, some of the universities will come up with a review. And uh, this year, after the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting, we at Rush put together a, a CME program, which is available online for uh, physicians and providers. <coughs> and some of the slides I will show will be from this meeting. As I mentioned, CLL is the commonest uh, leukemia in the Western world. It is a disease of the older people, and most of the time, 
the patients are asymptomatic and they may not need treatment, but there are very well defined indications of treatment. And uh, there have been many attempts to find out how we can prognosticate these patients, how we can risk categorize. One of the oldest way by which we categorize the risk factor is the famous Dr. Rai's uh, staging system where you can put them into low risk, intermediate, and high risk with a clearly distinct survival. <clears throat> there are many factors which may um, impact on this. One of the strongest predictors is the cytogenetic abnormalities. Patients who have, for example, the deletion of 17P chromosome, as you can see, if you look at the progression rate, they progress very quickly compared to patients who have 13Q deletion. They progress very slowly, even <clears throat> slower than patients with a normal chromosome. So I think the point I'm emphasizing is cytogenetics play a significant part in prognosis. But not only prognosis, now with the information we have from several randomized clinical trials, we are able to even select treatment based on cytogenetics. So this is an example. Uh, this is a trial where patients with CLL were treated with uh, fludarabine, one of the standard drugs, compared with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. And as you can see here, <clears throat> patients who had this 11Q abnormality, everyone responded when cyclophosphamide was added, whereas response rate was much lower when there was no alkylating agent. So now it is standard to add alkylating agents when patients have CLL with 11Q deletion. This is just an example. Like, for example, 17P deletion. Patients with 17P deletion, they do not respond very well to fludarabine, so we try to avoid fludarabine unless it is in a combination. So, but on the other hand, cytogenetics alone is not one that can predict the prognosis accurately. So there has been many prognostic models, including this is one of the most recently published uh, prognostic model, where they put scores for each of these characteristics, and they add it up and put, them, put the patients into low, intermediate, high, and very high risk category. And as you can see, there is a huge difference in the five-year survival. <clears throat> and even in this uh, classification, as you can see, the 17P deletion has one of the highest uh, uh, prognostic score. So what do we know about FCR versus B BR? FCR is a combination of fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, which was developed in Houston by Dr. Michael Keating and his colleagues, and it is still one of the best treatment combinations for CLL. On the other hand, it is not tolerated very well by older patients, and CLL is a disease of the older individual, so that is why regimens like bendamustin rituxan, bendamustin is a relatively new drug in this country, and this gives very similar results at the same time the toxicity is low. So we had a presentation in the last ASH meeting giving us some of the updates about the the comparison between the two regimens, FCR and BR. And what it showed was, as you can see here, there was difference between the complete remission rates with FCR showing better complete remission rates. And if you look at the progression-free survival also, the FCR seems to be doing better compared to BR. So I think the point I'm saying is FCR is still useful in younger patients who can tolerate chemotherapy. The second category of drugs is monoclonal antibodies in hematologic malignancies. As you know, uh, the first monoclonal antibody that was approved in this country for treatment of any cancer was uh, rituximab. That was in 1997 for low-grade lymphoma. So in CLL also, you can see there's a variety of monoclonal antibodies now, rituximab is approved in combination of a tumumab or a zera is a new uh, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. It has some advantages over rituximab. Alamtuzumab or Campath is CD52 directed treatment which has been around for more than 10 years. 
And uh, more recently, this drug got approved, Gaziva or Obinutuzumab, which is also CD20 directed, again, has some advantages over the more conventional anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies. So this is a trial that brought the, the newest one, the Obinutuzumab, into market, where it's a randomized study where the drug, which used to be called GA101, in combination with chlorambucil was compared to chlorambucil alone and rituximab with chlorambucil. And this study clearly was criticized because of the control arms. As you know, chlorambucil is still considered standard even though we rarely nowadays use it. And rituximab is such a weak agent in CLL because of many reasons that we know. But in any case, so based on the study, what they showed was they compared the two arms with rituxan and the GA101 or obinutuzumab. And as you can see here, there's a significant difference in the response rate between the two arms in favor of obinutuzumab. And uh, this new drug was able to put patients into minimal residual disease negative state much better than standard of care. And if you look at the progression-free survival, there's a clear advantage of the new antibody compared to the old one. And uh, the survival benefit, of course, did not reach statistical significance. So this was the study based on which uh, obinutuzumab was approved in combination with chlorambucil. Now I'll focus on some of the so-called new agents. These are small molecules. And these agents are oral, and that's one of the biggest advantage with these. <coughs> so the first is Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor. As you know, the B cell receptor <coughs> is interacted by various molecules, which leads on to activation of pathways that lead to leukemogenesis. So if you look at the B cell receptor, it's like an antenna on the top and various molecules interact with that. But the pathways that are leading on to leukemogenesis can be very much isolated. For example, the SIC inhibitor has been studied very well. There is a very good SIC inhibitor that has been proven to be active. It was present in one of the plenary sessions of ASCO. It has not yet reached the market. On the other hand, this pathway, the BTK or Bruton tyrosine kinase, is one that has been proven to be very good target. And this drug, ibrutinib, works specifically by inhibiting the BTK pathway. And the second drug, idolalizib, in, inhibits the PI3 kinase pathway, which is also a very vital pathway for CLL leukemogenesis. Now, ibrutinib is an oral agent many of you may have already uh, used it in your patients. One of the unique things about this drug is that in the beginning, the actual lymphocyte count in the blood increases before it starts coming down. And this is not something you see with the usual leukemia treatment. Typically, leukemia treatment, you give the drug, the counts go down. That's what we all would like to see uh, consistent with response. So this was one of the reasons why the drug development was delayed, because obviously people thought that the drug is probably adversely affecting the leukemia. Whereas what happened was, so on the other hand, the lymph nodes continue to decrease in the size. So what happens here is because the disruption of the BTK pathway also disrupt some of the anchoring mechanisms of these cancer cells into the bone marrow and the lymph nodes. So they are kind of stuck there. And the BTK pathway, when it is interrupted, it kind of releases, like the ship being released from the anchor. And these cells come into the cell from the lymph nodes and the uh, bone marrow. And ultimately, it gets eliminated. So that's the mechanism behind the lymphocytosis, which is something we need to be aware of. And some of the responses are dramatic, as you can see, an oral agent in a patient who had refractory CL, because we have to remember that once a patient is refractory to a regimen like fludarabine containing regimen, their outlook is like refractory or relapsed acute lymphatic leukemia. It is a few months before progression. And where here you can see dramatic responses. 
and single agent even in treatment naive and refractory patients are very high as you can see here and the duration response again you can see in untreated patients versus refractory even the refractory patients is uh, very impressive so that is one drug and uh, once cybrutinib <coughs> was uh, shown to be active the next thing is of course to combine with other agents and uh, one of the trial was to combine with rituximab which showed even better responses the second drug is idelalizib which is also an oral agent and this was studied in combination with rituximab and again uh, I showed you the BCR, the B-cell receptor pathway, and this drug specifically inhibits the PI3 kinase pathway. And this is a trial, it's a complicated trial regimen, but rituximab plus the drug versus rituximab plus placebo. So that was the design of the trial. And uh, these are the response rates clearly, as you can see, in favor of the drug <coughs> compared to placebo. And uh, if you look at the progression-free survival, again, there's a significant difference between the two. And this also translated into an overall survival which was significantly different. And uh, the data was also uh, published in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine to correspond with the presentation at the ASH meeting. Finally, the third drug, which is not in the market yet, is the ABT199, which has a different mechanism. Unlike the other two I said, they specifically inhibit pathways here. It inhibits BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic marker. And this is the trial regimen based on which the drug was studied in the beginning. And uh, there are adverse events, especially tumor lysis syndrome is something that is known with this drug. It probably indicates the activity that uh, it, it works fairly fast. In fact, um, one of the other drugs, Oblimersin, which didn't come into the market, also had the same issue, that is rapid tumor lysis leading on to morbidity and sudden death. So that is something that is being addressed. Uh, in terms of the response rate, as you can see here, even in patients with the adverse prognostic <coughs> factors like deletion of 17P chromosome and fludarabine refractory, these patients respond very well to this agent. So, so what I have done is the, to show you the data based on which the two drugs already got approved and the third one is very likely to be coming into the market. Now. Just to show you an example of how the patients are benefiting from this, I'm showing the story of one of my own patients who three or four years back went into one of the clinical trials. SJ, a 90-year-old, diagnosed with CLL in 1994, had already fludarabine-based and standard chlorambucil and bendamustin subsequently. In 2009, five years back, she had worsening performance status, lymph nodes, and cytopenia requiring transfusion at that point. We didn't have many other options after all these treatment in a 90-year-old. So well, that's why hospice was considered. But she was enrolled in this trial. This is the uh, name of the, it used to be the name of the ibrutinib drug in clinical trial. In fact, she got enrolled in a trial with ibrutinib and rituximab. And five years later, actually four years after entering into trial, She's doing well with the normal blood counts, which we haven't seen with any treatments in the past. So this is an example of how these patients have benefited from some of these new agents. So the last uh, one or two slides, I will <coughs> mention a novel strategy of treatment of CLL, that is CAR or CAR. So CAR research is speeding ahead. So what if we can <coughs> eliminate the leukemia cells by using patients on T cells. So this procedure is so-called chimeric antigen receptor. That's a CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. You may have a few years back heard in television and newspaper that uh, 
somebody in Philadelphia or Pennsylvania came up with data showing that the first study was in CLL where they were able to eliminate evidence of cancer cells by doing this. So what they do is they take out the patient's own T cells and then genetically modify so that it expresses the CD19 receptor. CD19, as you know, is a antigen for B cells. <coughs> expressed in majority of B-cell malignancies. So these T-cells are <clears throat> now expressing the, the receptors for CD19, and if you reinfuse into the patient after a course of chemotherapy, it goes around and essentially attracts every CD19 positive cells. And the beauty of this treatment is these cells hang around so that it keeps eliminating those cells, trying to prevent recurrence or relapse. So it is certainly a very attractive mode of treatment, and um, there has been subsequent trials in acute lymphoblastic uh, leukemia and other diseases clearly showing this treatment is effective. There's a lot of things that need to be ironed out, like, for example, it eliminates CD19-positive cells in general, which means, as you know, the immunoglobulin levels go down, so these patients need immunoglobulin infusions, things like that. But I have a feeling that uh, if the research is going the way it is now in the next few years, it may even become part of standard of care. So I'm going to end here. So what I have done is to give you an overview of some of the new developments in CLL. And then I focused on some of the standard of care, <coughs> including combinations like FCR, BR, and monoclonal antibodies. And then I emphasize some of the recent development with the novel agents which work in novel ways, as well as some of the novel strategies. And I will end it here, and uh, I don't know if I'm taking questions now or at the end. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs>